rolling on. So welcome. Uh, I'm Adam, a co-founder of Siegel, uh, Seattle GNU Linux Conference. This year, T Siegel turns six in Seattle, November. And I also run an engineering and data science team in Seattle for CSATs. Uh, uh, just to say a quick word, that it's a healthcare pioneer in objective measurement and improvement of surgeon technical skill. Uh, pretty lucky to work there, and we work with a ton of free software uh, as part of our job. We do contribute back to some projects. And we're now part of the Johnson & Johnson Institute, so we can share our education tools with healthcare professionals worldwide. And I've got a bit of an adventure here today. There's plenty of room in case other folks show up, but they don't know what they're missing yet, because we're going to meet Louise and follow her through tears and joy, death and life. In the end, she'll only succeed if she's able to save the day with free software. Hang in there. I'll be reading some key points uh, for the vision impaired. Um, I guess we got the live stream all set, so I don't need to read for that. Uh, the deck is also online. Just go to adammonson.com. You can grab the deck in plain text and in uh, rendered format. And this is just so I remember how to actually go through my slides. Uh, Creative Commons, good to go. Attribution share alike. This is the story of four chickens. Here they are. They met a hungry little furball, and they quickly became a flock of one. Raccoon versus chicken, it's like car versus bike. This is the story of the chicken who lived. Meet Louise, our stealthy Americana. I call her stealthy because she was the only one that survived all the attacks. She wants a new flock, but first she needs a safer home, one with an automatic door. This, of course, requires requires the following. It's, so the, I'm not going to read all the, the point is that it's easy to get carried away, uh, and, and I did, uh, but uh, it, it is important to, to solve your problem, so we'll get into iteration, but there is a lot at stake, so it's easier to get carried away when there's, there's a lot at stake. So here's an example of, of, of when you mess up the timing for this kind of thing. Here you've got Rainbow sitting on top of Afro, but don't worry, we'll focus and iterate, and eventually we'll end up with this. So here's uh, the coop my partner and I built, and uh, it's a coop inside of a shed. Um, the controller computer's up here. There's wires going everywhere. Uh, you can't see them because the sensors are pretty small. There's a light sensor over here. Uh, there's the motor right here. There's Hall effect magnetic sensors here and there. Uh, and you kind of have an open breadboard up here with the Raspberry Pi. It makes everything easy to plug in. So let's zoom in a bit. Uh, it's a four bird coop. Got a nesting, there's a nesting box, so kind of the, the, uh, the, the chicken part of it is actually where they lay their eggs. Um, this is where they get their water, food, and there's a the door to the uh, world outside. So let's zoom in on the door. That's the point of this talk. Uh, this is the door open and closed. Open during the day, closed at night. So, oh, by the way, I, didn't, I don't know if I said, but I welcome questions in the middle. Just, like, interrupt me if they're on topic, and if they're not, I'll just kind of say, well, I'll kind of scoot it along. But go ahead and, and yell out, and I'll deal with it best I can. Uh, here's the Raspberry Pi controller computer. Uh, it's got computer power. You're, you're, you're looking at the computer itself. Um, breakout board, so you can plug everything in. Uh, there's power. And... Okay, good, that's the plan. So this is the gravity lock mechanism unlatching. And this is uh, just the door traveling up. And uh, with the camera, we get, uh, I'm gonna come back, there we go. So we get motion activated video capture using the program Motion. Uh, it's off the shelf uh, on all the popular repositories. Uh, but here's a couple image samples. First, this is Louise going in for the night. So she came in through the door, which was thankfully open because the software worked, and uh, just pops right in there. And the other birds kind of figured it out too just by following her. I'll, uh, if, if we were to add more birds in the future, I don't want to spoil the whole thing. Uh, here's a, let's try it again. Here's a nosy neighbor. I don't know if you can see that too well, it's a, it's a squirrel. Just looking to see if there's any eggs. And then, you know, she didn't take anything, she just left. Just want to see who was there. I think that the coop was brand new and I was watching every video. Well, let's check back on Louise. So she likes the new coop, but when it comes to that door, she's suspicious. That's okay, she'll get over it. 
It's going to keep her alive. But let's talk about chickens real quick, because this is important. Like the, the biology of chickens a little bit is, uh, is important. So you got to know uh, these three things about chickens. You can never get them wet. You can never expose them to sunlight. And you can never feed them after midnight. Anyone? Where is that from? Gremlin. Thank you. 1984. Let's try again. Uh, Gremlins in 1984. OK, here's the real chicken primer. I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're that simple. This is how they work. Um, I, I'm kind of, I feel a little bad saying that. Um, they do a lot of cool things, but it seems like it's automatic. Like it's just built into their, their, their DNA. Here's a uh, basic <laughs> chicken input-output diagram. I, I do this myself. And note that they also eat bugs and rocks. <laughs> OK, here's a couple fun facts about chicken eyes. Uh, the right is nearsighted. The left is farsighted. This is kind of interesting because while they're in the shell, while they're in the egg, uh, the right eye goes up near the shell. The left eye stays in their feathers. Uh, the right eye becomes nearsighted as a result of this, and the left eye remains farsighted. The two, eye, two eyes can operate independently. Uh, so the right eye could be seen for something up close, like bugs in the dirt, and the left eye could, could find a hawk at the same time. Uh, they're also quite large. The eyes are 10% of their head, so there isn't much room left over for brains. So we have to keep them safe. That's our job. And finally, the, they evolved diurnal, uh, so their night vision is poor. Uh, they evolved after dinosaurs. I, I guess we, we helped them. But all this leads to they just, you, you, if you want to keep them alive, you must lock them in at night because of this, this guy. So that's it. Just take home message. The chickens get in before dust. They're, they're pros at this. All you need to do is lock it at night, every night. Oh, yeah, every night. And open up in the morning, uh, every morning. And then the summers around here, well, same as Seattle, where I'm from, uh, it's early, uh, really early. And you'll forget sometimes. It's not so bad to let them forget to, uh, if you forget to let them out, but if you forget to lock them in, that's bad enough. So let's, um, let's get this rolling here. Uh, here's the, the long and short about automating the door itself. And we'll quickly run through these. So. Uh, the kind of hardware we used, uh, the little computer, the one I chose is the Raspberry Pi. It's not free, uh, disclaimer, this is Libre Planet. Uh, you can find free ones, the Libre T is interesting, BeagleBoard uh, I think is closer, but I don't, I, I'm not an expert in open hardware, uh, but there are folks here that are. Uh, but the software is free because I wrote it. Anyway, here's the, let's zip through the hardware real quick. Uh, the Pi, it's the, the computer itself, 50 bucks. A couple other things, some wires. This is honestly, this is the fun part, is parting it out. Uh, fuse, yeah, I ran it with a fuse for, for a, without a fuse for a while, and uh, my good friend said, you're crazy, because <laughs> can I still let it, you know? Anyway, don't do that. Uh, also, power supply is kind of important. I went, yeah, so I, I, it comes with the power supply, but you gotta get an extra one, because the original one is unregulated, and oh boy. Here's kind of the, Layout of the computer. The the Pi 3 is now not the latest model. Now there, I think there's a more recent one. Uh, but here's the basic components. Any questions? It's it's pretty standard. I mean, what's what's crazy is, you know, the the from in the previous talk there was a, we were talking about the bomb, B O M B E, the computer that helped crack the Enigma. I mean, if you compare the the size and it just how, how far we smash this uh, kind of following Moore's law into this tiny compact system is pretty incredible. Here you go for the breakout of the hardware. Uh, you get all kinds of cool little gadgets with the starter kit. It's 30 bucks. Uh, I only used a fraction of these for this project, uh, but I was, I was interested in using, I, I think for a future one it'd be fun to use this LCD. Now this is kind of a more complicated component and so it, it has all these pins and I think you just, you, you follow a, a pattern to wire that up, and then you can control the software. I haven't got to that yet, but um, I'll show you the ones I did. Camera's extremely easy. You plug it in. You get night vision. Uh, these are infrared lamps, uh, and these are detectors to see if it has to switch to infrared mode, visible light mode. Wires. Uh, this is kind of important. You've got to have a low-geared motor. So it's called a worm drive. Kind of fun. Uh, this is kind of your standard motor, but then this gearing box is pretty critical to get it down to just the right speed. You can't take one of those little spinny motors 
This is what I tried first. And then you try and hook that into a dowel that's turning the string that's going to raise the thing because it doesn't have the torque you need. Uh, so 13 bucks for a fuse. Don't forget the fuse. And 32 gig, adapt, uh, 32 gig SD. And you, you can't do this 64 with the Raspberry Pi. Anyway, I got, don't worry about all these gotchas. I figured them all out so you don't have to with your next project. Uh, and this is the thing that can uh, detect magnets. It's called a Hall effect sensor. A magnet comes near it. Um, and you get, uh, I think it's just, this one's just binary. And so it tells you once, uh, once a magnet is within a certain range. <coughs> This is pretty key for detecting when the door is actually closed. Like, did it work successfully? You can't just assume. Test leads for just, because I'm, I didn't, I, I think I still haven't soldered most of the wires, but once you have the thing set up, they're clipped together, just don't touch it, unless the chickens kind of come by and flap them off. So that, that's something we got to fix. Oh, and a regulated power supply. Make sure you, you don't use the one out of the box. Oh, and then, so my partner did uh, the woodworking. Uh, she's also a, a mathematician, software engineer, but she's also better at me than at carpentry, and so she did all that stuff, and all the, the initial pictures um, built all that in the door itself, so I did the software part. Now, I oh, apologize, my emojis aren't showing up. Uh, they're kind of important, actually, because I use a lot of emoji for visual cues, and uh, there's particular visual cues, oh, I have, actually, images embedded here, you'll see the emoji later, but it's important for just, if you're going to quickly scan logs, you don't even have to read the text if you have emoji. I, actually, I think it's pretty handy. So just the little icons that, that show you what's going on. So real quick, I'll detail into uh, the door itself. It looks pretty complicated, but basically you have two door states, closed and open. And just this is kind of a state transition diagram. This is how you get from open to closed, depending on the situation. If you guys want to take a look at that real quick and then... Any questions? Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. So we're, we're, when it's closed, we can either force it open with a command or we can wait to, for dawn to happen. And then we, in, we install, we, we set up a lock so these two things can't be trying to happen at once because you only have one door. And then when you successfully start it, it's actually opening. And then it either times out or it successfully hits the top magnet. And then at that point, the door is open and Similarly for nighttime or force close. Okay? Okay, so log emoji. Oh, good, I do have a screenshot. Okay, so I, I, honestly, this is like, okay, if you got to look at the log, I'm just like, Bruh. I skipped all these because I'm like, oh, this is just status, I don't care. Uh, but then w when you want the detail, so again, just the, the pictures help you just scan really quickly. And this is actually a text, text sample, and uh, I think this browser just doesn't have the emoji fonts, but... Uh, this would show these exact same, these exact same uh, icons. This is I, I have been using Slack to to do logging, uh, but this is a plain text log, and I'm going to change it to log somewhere else. It's free. So yeah, that starter kit with all those tiny little parts, uh, you got to get one of those to get started, unless you actually happen to have all this stuff in your garage or pockets or uh, already. And this particular company offers email support too. And I did email them a couple times because their Python library was working for some things and not others and similarly for the C libraries. So they came with both a C SDK and a Python SDK. And I, grad I, I always try Python first, uh, just higher level, simpler to get started. Uh, but for some of the things I actually had to use their C code and mess around a bit. But it, it, the kit really does help you, uh, the, the, all that messy stuff in between. Okay, it's it's, how do you how do you make a thing in the real world move with just a line of code? They walk you through all of that. Um, here's project one from that a deep starter kit. You plug in a few parts, and you can blink an LED with a line of code. So that was pretty enticing to me. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I get the fun part of plugging in these wires, and then boom, uh, you can run one command to do to do the blinking. Uh, so, so some guidance you want to, a lot of the point of this is to try and inspire you to, to, okay, fine, I'll finally get one of these and a few wires and I'll, well, I'll think of something, right? Uh, I'll check when the, when the temperature in my house goes above 100 degrees, I'll send myself a, a notification, something like that. It should inspire you to do your own stuff. So, uh, but I just, it, it's fraught with disaster all along the way. And so what I'm trying to do here is give you a lot of tips to get through it successfully. Uh, I did a little time-lapse video 
uh, kid, you know, while I was getting, to, getting, getting used to it, I did a lot of projects with the kids, and one of them was just, okay, this computer's gonna beep, and every time it beeps, it's been a minute, and then you can go, when you, and then you can wait till you, wait till you hear a camera sound, and then move the thing, and they were doing that for hours. <laughs> so we got them moving Lego guys and you know, all around for days. Uh, so free chakra. Uh, and then, well, $30 chakra. The other part here, oh yeah, so I also want a, a tip, hat tip to, the, the Pi is not free hardware, but um, check out the EOMA standards, uh, EOMA 68 standard and, uh, and others. These are, these are linked to here. Uh, those, those are links. Boop. Sorry, I got a different screen here. Uh, always ask for help. Browser's not showing emoji, but there, there would be lots of emoji. And uh, I should just call the sock chicken emoji, I think, the amount of, I'm pushing my emoji. So some things to keep in mind here. Again, general tips, tricks, uh, things you can run along the way. This, these are hardware bugs that the, the Raspberry Pi folks will probably fix along the way, you know, power consumption and how it starts and notification of when, when it, if you do have too many things plugged in and the power's going low, you'd, it'd be great to know about that. Um, but I was, I run this one as uh, the one at home uh, headless, and so you have to be watching logs when stuff happens. And it was pretty important to me that it was Wi-Fi, but it also had to work uh, if there was a network partition if the if the Wi-Fi went down. And uh, yep, use a 32 gig card. Try that camera. Uh, the hardware part, uh, hardware is. Called hardware for a reason, I think. Uh, I, I think <laughs> people are good at it, but I'm, I'm pretty, I, I spend a ton of time on the software and trying to make that bulletproof. But no amount of software is gonna fix a spindle that's trying to open the door and it's just slipping. You know, it's just like, it's, so, I, I, yeah, like throwing more glue at it, you know, that kind of thing. You can get it to work. Uh, this thing's been running for a couple of years at this point now. Oh, PWM, that's a fun thing. I think, I wanna say pulse width modulation. So that's where you, you try and, take a spinny motor and make it into a slower motor, and you can slow it down, <laughs> but you can't give it torque just on its own. Uh, so you, the PWM is basically uh, telling it to move, instead of just sending power to it like this, on, off, you're going and adjusting the pulses until they get it to the right speed you want. So you can make a fast motor slow, but you can't just give it torque, you need gearing for that. Uh, some of the easier things, so it's really easy to play with, uh, with a magnetic sensor. You can, you can do all sorts of, think of all sorts of cool projects and do with that. Um, the light sensor as well, it just kind of works, but with this gotcha here that the Python photos that your code didn't work. Uh, but with those kind of things are basically two wires, plug in, try the thing, and it, you get the thing uh, wired up on that breadboard, and then you can run code right away that gives you the output. I mean, usually most of these are, so Hall effect and a Hall effect is a binary, so you get a one or a zero if it's if it's in the field or not. Uh, the photoresistor gives you a uh, range, so you get from negative 160 to 160 or so, and it's tuned so that zero is dusk or dawn. So if you're doing a photoresistor project, I want to do something uh, along with the sun. The sun comes up, I'm going to detect it. All you have to do is look for it passing zero. Now you want a threshold, right? You want to think, you know, think through this a bit. Like I did the software and I made it zero to start. Well, there's bounce, right? So there, there's, you, you might go above zero and then a car might drive by and shine at it so it bounces a little bit. So basically you say, consider it dawn when it passes 10 and consider it dusk when it passes negative 10 or something. So you set a little range and then outside of that range is a clean uh, dust dawn barrier. But those are, those are pretty fun projects because they're all you know, a few lines of code, get started, you get more complex, you can iterate. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> kind of a, a um, uh, real space problem is that these supposedly nocturnal predators, like, oh, they're fine during the day, right? No, chickens are not, they're also not fine during the day. So they have to be fenced in entirely. I mean, that's why at the zoo, I suppose, they're all in this, you know, there's, there's fencing and all, all over the place because sometimes raccoons are hungry during the day, or they're injured, or there's new babies, or it's spring, or you know, all there's a hundred things. Or maybe a hawk is flying by and it's really sunny. Uh, I think my partner the other day caught a hawk uh, holding on to Afro, one of the little, the little ones, and just scared her off. The hawk wasn't strong enough to pick her up. 
thankfully, or tear it apart. But you have to have the chickens uh, fenced entirely. Now, you still want the door closed at night, though, because if you've got the coop uh, and it's open, rats will come in and get food and stuff like that. So, Yeah, so this was kind of cool. With the, with the data about the light levels moving over time, you could see the eclipse happen. And so I made a little chart, and sure enough, uh, it happened to go, I think it was through Corvallis, Oregon, but pretty near Seattle. And so we got a, a good enough effect from that full total, uh, the total eclipse recently. Uh, always MLP, MLP, is that minimum lovable product? I use, I use that instead of viable because I'm like, viable is like, it's barely alive. I want the thing that's easy to do and fast, but I, but I gotta love it. Otherwise, I, can, I, can, I don't wanna, <laughs> I didn't do this for, I don't, I'm not getting paid, I gotta do this for fun and, and the chickens need it. And of course, use free software. So this is kind of funny and, uh, yeah, so I've been throwing my videos up on YouTube, so I'm like, I don't care, whatever. And they detected that there was a content violation. I wonder if I can play, do I have the actual one? Ah. I don't have a link to it. I'll, I, if somebody asks me, I'll gladly make a, a link to their actual video, but it's like the picture I showed, her, the video I showed earlier, which is a chicken, it's a chicken in the coop. There's no way. We built the entire coop, we bought the chicken grew up, there's no way that's a copyright violation. Anyway, censorship, uh, you know, think about it when you choose the software you work with, there it comes. Uh, let's see, so yeah, these are just links to get the parts yourself. And um, more parts. Thank you, I just, it's kind of funny, this slide, there's a lot of M's. I don't know why, but I think that says something. I just did a quick visual frequency analysis. I'm like, ah, a lot of M's. Anyway, I wanna hear what works for you. Try something out, uh, I wanna hear what you think about this this presentation, everything as well. Um, uh, so please let me know. Uh, thank you. And do you guys, now we have some time. I made some. I made a little time for questions. So let's do it. Yeah. So acceptable topics. Topics are chickens, hardware, and software. Hey, Deb. Hi. <laughs> it's so great to finally see this talk. Um, my question is, I know you did a lot of this with your kids. Like, can you give folks at home, like, what sense of age group the different parts of the project are for? So if someone's like, oh, you know, and they're, like, looking at their six-month-old, you're not throwing them in the chicken coop yet. But, like, when are they ready to start participating on the code and the other parts? Oh, totally. Great question. Thank you. Well, uh, I think I, I, so part of it's like parenting style as well. And so I, I wanted to wait a little later to get them in front of screens at all. Um, so, but this, but our six year old was stoked to participate in the, for example, the time lapse video experiment. So as I was learning the five, I set up the time lapse camera and they could move stuff around and then I just hit a button and uh, compile the video. And they love seeing that. So six-year-old uh, getting involved in the code. I would say like a 10-year-old. I mean, every kid's different, but ours, at this point now, she's writing code and, and interested in it. And she could totally hack the Python stuff. And, I'm, and of course, if there's anything, I'm like, okay, you can play any game you want as long as you load it from the command line. <laughs> so, and then that includes moving the chicken door. So if you use the command line, you can move the chicken door. So she does how she can like magic open. Now, we don't, <laughs> so yeah, and roughly in general, I, I'd say around then. Yeah, cool. okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank, good question. Anything else? Is anybody, okay, let me ask you guys a question. You folks question. So who's, who has done uh, hardware projects, period, okay? Who hasn't but wants to? Come on, okay. <laughs> If you're going like this, it means you want to. So the, the thing, is, yeah, it's all right. So one thing we did at, at a Siegel talk, actually, two years ago, somebody brought a bunch of breadboards and a battery and an LED light. That was, you just like, okay, fine, I'll try it. And you plug it in, you're like, uh huh, well, that did something. And then you could control it with your own software. I don't know, the, the light kind of turned on for me when um, we just started plugging stuff in. And it gets tangible. Because code is so intangible, I, I, thought, I think it's very, unless you just have this really insane drive to want to do more code, 
then it's hard to connect it to uh, people's lives. I mean, software is for people. So uh, I think the hardware can, can really bridge the gap. And there's so many choices now with the cheap, uh, cheap kits and stuff like that. So there are good excuses for that. What else? Can you tell us about safety? Can a chicken get crushed by the door? Oh, man, I get that question every time, and that is a great question. Uh, yes, they, they, I'll tell you about safety. So they don't get crushed in the door for a couple reasons. One, it's, um, it's not that heavy, and they're strong enough to fend it off. And they, when they're scared, they're fast. So uh, <laughs> the time, well, that didn't suck. <laughs> I'm not challenging them with it, but basically, no. It's, it's not an issue because it, uh, it comes down slowly on a, on a reeled up string. And so it's, it's not a hazard to them so much as if it were driven, driven, it's not hard driven like by a gear. They do have those kinds of doors though. And in fact, I'm a little sad to say, now they do sell a light activated chicken door, but it, it costs more than this, but you don't have to, you don't have to do any of the project. Um, but of course you don't get the experience of, uh, of learning that, you know, which parts to do and not do. But did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Second question is, can you imagine extending this to open like a human door for dogs? Yes, absolutely. So, so uh, like a, a normal door you'd have in your house? Yeah, I think the difference is you need a step, you need to control a more powerful thing. So basically your challenge at that point would be coming up with a mechanism that opens the door, which does have to be pretty beefy, right? Unlatch and move a, a big physical door. We, we put a lot of pounds of pressure on that. And, but the pie side, I mean, that would be the simplest code ever, honestly. You just have to control a switch that does the rest. All, almost all the, the difficulty there would be in hardware. <laughs> so, yeah. Opening, closing, like all these little actions. Detecting something that's binary, incredibly easy. So the magnetic, uh, oh, a magnet comes into place. So you could think about one of the big things that happens with installing a security system is they want, oh, we're going to put things at every door and window. Well, that is the simplest part of the whole system. It's just a Hall effect sensor, and there's a magnet in the moving part, and, uh, and that's it. But yeah, good questions. Thank you. What other? I want to ask you guys another question. How about, I was going to ask about uh, who, who knows how to write a little Python code or shell code, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you could all absolutely code on the Pi. Um, none of my stuff is, well, there was a couple things I dug into a lot, which, but now you don't have to, because I told you you don't have to, but PWM, pulse width modulation, is, is tricky code. And so I was messing around with that a little bit. But you don't have to do that now. Um, and, but the, this, this simple code, like, oh, is the light on, is it, is it dawn, do something? Easy code, no problem. Uh, it, it gets as complicated as you want, but getting started is, is very straightforward. Yeah, I The EOMA 6.8 is a standard, and I believe the Libra T meets that standard. And it looks like a PCMCIA card, right? OK. So I assume they were. There were prices. And if you just search EOMA 6.8. Kind of oh. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yep, no. That's a great point. So yeah, that's what's so convenient about the Pi is that breakout board where you just start plugging wires in. So it tells you all of the wires and where they go. I'll just show you the diagram of. Let's get to you. Well, that's mine broken out, right? So it's extremely easy to just. We, in fact, we could have probably added four or five more sensors on that breakout board. But um, so I don't know. How would you do that with the EOMA? Oh, thank you. It, it's, a, it's a lot harder to do it with a QB truck, or I assume with a line board, than the Pi, even though they have a very similar GPIO setup, mm -hmm. uh, because you have to enable the pin. 
And I guess you can enable some simple GPIO pins if you're just echoing things to the file and the kernel turns it on. But if you're doing something more complicated, like using one wire sensors mm -hmm. and stuff, the Raspberry Pi makes it all very simple. Uh -huh, it's okay. in the bootloader. And this other stuff, you have to go hack the kernel. <laughs> I think that'd be extreme. So the, the question originally was, uh, the an EMA 68 uh, computer doesn't have a breakout board for plugging all these things in like we have pictured here. So how would you actually use one? Yeah, it sounds like a great business opportunity to make that intermediate part to break them all out or allow inputs in different different lines. I I I would be surprised if someone hasn't made it yet. Could you do you mind getting the microphone back to him? Thank you. Uh, how exactly does the part work where the chicken, where at a certain time of, er, it, it, in the evening the chicken approaches the gate and the camera, the image uh, code determines that it is the chicken and not a fox, and then it open, and then it just it begins the door activation. That's I didn't I didn't make that part of this project. Were you saying how would it work? Yeah, we could walk through that. I, I thought through that a bit. So the question is, how would it work if, let me just make sure I get this right, I know they could hear you already, but uh, how would you do it, to, how would you detect the animal approaching the door and confirm it's a chicken? Yeah, um, well I guess the way I would do it is, uh, honestly, I, you, you could go with computer vision, that kind of thing, and machine learning, but I, I think I'd rather try and stack the deck in my favor and use um, RFID tags on the chicken legs because uh, those have a decent range, and then we're dealing with pretty close ranges in the coop anyway, and so you just need the, in fact, we're looking at the right place here, if you just had kind of a, a detector board right here, the, you know, the thing that has the induction loop and sends the current and all that, that could be right here, and then each chicken passes, and then what you wanna do is confirm maybe 10 minutes of them being present, so maybe you get a, a bunch of readings within 10 minutes, and then they pass the threshold, and they're like, oh, they're probably all in there, and close the door based on that. I guess I would not do the photovoltaic sensor and light checks at that point, because then you'd have two signals that would disagree. Um, but you could just, you could, I guess you could decide, decide what to do and notify yourself if they disagree. Um, that's a time where you'd need human intervention, right, to check. Oh, human maybe got left out. Anyway, that's the way I'd do it. So, so it, right now, I mean, I can be done very soon, but right now, if there's any movement near the gate, and it's evening, and the chicken is outside the gate, then it opens the gate, and then once it's inside, it closes the gate, and then it doesn't uh -huh. open till morning, and the chicken moves. You could, I, I, no offense, I call it over-engineering, because you don't need it closed while they're not in it. And it, doesn't have, it can just be a, a moving, a, if a moving thing, you know, at the risk of it being tumbleweed, right? It, uh, say again? So ba basically, something moves near the gate, the gate opens. Yeah. It goes in, then the gate closes. Then the oh, gate something else can the trigger gate, it. Then the I gate see. doesn't open, yeah. and, th and this is in the evening. And then, so then it's nighttime, and then at sunrise, then it waits until something's near the gate, and then it opens. Yeah. Unless, of course, the chicken is, well, it has to be moving, so if it fell, fell asleep near the gate, it doesn't open right away. But I think you and the other, the other person were asking a similar question as far as like, I'm thinking of a door that's triggered by something coming up to it. And uh, I did, there, there is one project documented pretty well with the cat comes up to the, the thing and it's got facial recognition, it's just the cat's, that particular cat structure. That's a, somebody did a whole, a whole rundown on that. And uh, I, could, I could imagine adding that algorithm, I mean just with the camera, in fact that's the camera right there just pointing down in the coop. Um, you point that out, you could, use, you could totally use the same technique they're using. Okay, the thing comes close, you have computer vision that detects, boop, gets a, gets a picture in the right format, compares it. Um, be tricky to make that fast. I mean, you need like a mobile, mobile net architecture for the image recognition maybe, and those don't perform quite as well, and so you probably have false positives. Look at, you have to look at your true positive rate, make sure it's, <laughs> it's looking good. But it is, that is significantly more complex, I would say, and probably have quite a bit more error. Yeah, but, it's, I could see how it'd be a lot more useful. It'd, it'd be useful for a, a cat door, or dog door, that kind of thing. Chickens, eh? I just you let them out into a fence area, make sure that it's closed at night, good to go. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Who else wants to talk? Oh, any more questions? All right.
but it's gone. Thank you.